Hello, I'm Dr. Breach Burke of the Cathonia Podcast. Um, today, what I'm talking about is the introduction to my book, which is called Death and the Maiden. And the subtitle is The Curious Relationship Between the Fear of the Feminine and the Fear of Death. Very important if you decide you want to buy it on Amazon because you won't find it without the sub. You could find it with my name, but not with the subtitle. But not without the subtitle because there's a lot of things called Death and the Maiden out there. Um, this came out from Algora Publishing in uh, September of 2019. And it is the revision of my doctoral dissertation that I did at Drew University. Uh, required an awful lot of research on <clears throat> this idea of the, what's really amounted to an idea about the dark feminine and about the way the feminine is devalued in our culture in particular. Now, uh, so the question then becomes, what do we mean by the terms masculine and feminine? And being that there's often a psychological approach to this book, what also does that mean? So people who are not necessarily, you know, maybe they haven't read this whole book, maybe they're not intending to, or even people who just, um, you know, I have a lecture series that you may or may not follow up with on Scholars of the Borderland on this book. This particular lecture is going to be introductory and free, as I mentioned on YouTube. The other ones will be available very inexpensively on <clears throat> Scholars of the Borderland, uh, on which is... Um, the homepage for that is on cathonia.net also. So uh, <clears throat> if you, even if you don't intend to actually take that class or even finish reading the entire work or whatever, this, this uh, particular introduction is also useful for people who are, uh, you know, who want to know about, you know, what, what I mean by these concepts. If you're looking for something to help elucidate what I'm what I'm talking about when I when I go into these podcasts and I talk about the you know the feminine or the dark feminine, what am I assuming, and and what what do we mean by those assumptions? Uh, that I answer that question in this particular lecture, and I'm also talking about archetype theory and about you know the reason why I think uh, a devalued feminine or an expression of the dark feminine is important to to this cult to our culture important to understand and important for us to um to address why why i think this is part of you know the the problem that we have of a split society a tribal society in which you know you you're either with us or against us um especially when it comes to politics especially when it comes to um you know lots of things religion versus science debate there's all kinds of areas in which it's, you know, you have to pick a side. And if you imply any kind of, um, you know, um, interest in or entertain the notion of the other side, then you're automatically on the other side, right? So, you know, so this, this deals with a lot of that, um, you know, as background to why, why Cathonia at all? Why, why do we talk about this stuff? Like, who cares, right? And, and why are we talking about it from this perspective? So, so the people even who listen to the podcast that don't actually intend to, you know, read the book or follow through with the lectures, this, you know, this little introduction should still be helpful to you. Okay. So with that little preface, I'm going to bring up the um, presentation. Okay. So we're we're going to talk about the, again, the introduction to this particular book. And largely the introduction has uh, a lot of definitions. This, this defines where I'm going with this whole thing, what the whole concept is, and what we mean by these ideas of masculine, feminine, and so forth. And what the argument and premise is behind, um, behind this book, and then ultimately <clears throat> by association, the whole Cophonia concept. Okay, so the main thesis of this book is, and uh, I was I was told by my dissertation director to put this. She says she says fit your, your thesis on the back of a business card, please. And believe it or not, this does fit on the back of a business card. Uh, she says belief in an immortal soul and salvation has a paradoxically negative impact, or maybe not paradoxically. I can get into that on perceptions of the archetypal feminine in myth, religious scripture, and philosophy. And this book looks at the idea through the lens of depth psychology, through which, as I say, I feel it can be demonstrated through that lens. So <clears throat> what do we mean by this? Well, um, when we talk about ancient religion, you're, when you talk about life after death, uh, people always assume that somehow the idea of judgment has been around. They assume the idea that um, <clears throat> there's always been 
Hades, for example, is frequently referred to as hell by a lot of people. The, the heaven hell concept or axis in, um, you know, in Western thinking about the afterlife uh, <clears throat> under whatever name you prefer to call it is generally considered, there, there's, some, there's always been an assumption, even among scholars, that somehow this, some version of this model has always been. And this is simply not true. There was a time when death was uh, a great equalizer in a lot of ways. Now, again, we're talking Near Eastern culture here right now. I mean, um, we can find examples of this elsewhere also, uh, especially in areas that are, are Christianized or that were later, um, you know, by, by some, some monotheistic religion, and that's Judaism, Christianity, Islam, primarily the, 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 the last two, not the former, um, where, where we see, for example, the Christianization of Europe. Uh, where you might see this also in concepts of the afterlife or other world being changed after um, you know Christian monks come in and get a hold of those writings and and um, you know and you know copy them in their own way with their own inflection. So <clears throat> you know there's so in short, what we're saying, you know, this idea of salvation after death. This idea that somehow you're being saved from death, which later became the idea that you were being saved from eternal punishment of some kind, um, actually has a very negative impact on the way we think about what I'm calling the archetypal feminine or, you know, the feminine with a capital F. And as I frequently say to people, I say this is not about men and women or this is not just about, you know, you know, misogyny or why women are second-class citizens. I mean, it, it has something to do with that, but that's not the main point when I talk about the feminine with a capital F. That pertains to both men and women, as we're going to see. So, yeah, so one, so salvation theory, the idea of salvation from death, somehow, paradoxically, um, you know, rather than, you know, it, it ends up not only devaluing the feminine, but devaluing the earth itself. Okay, and, and our perceptions about the earth. Something we need to think about in an era where climate change is an issue um, and the need to, to make substantial changes to how we deal with our environment are at the forefront. Okay, so this book starts, we talk about the good, the true, and the pure, okay? So let me read to you a little from my introduction here and then I'll explain. Okay, <clears throat> the ancient philosophers champion humanism. Uh, seeing humans with their sense of reason as capable of knowing truth, in quotation marks. We see the true beginnings of morality and ethical thinking in ancient Greece. While this seems like noble progress, and maybe in some ways it is, there are unintended consequences of continually seeking the good, the true, and the pure. Uh, people who know me know that I've, I've, uh, I've <laughs> the idea that um, I, I think this is noble progress at all, uh, that, 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 that position has decidedly changed, uh, probably even more so since I've written this, but we attempt to identify ourselves with these positive attributes while disavowing their opposites. Uh, and the consequences can be seen today in a culture where everyone has to be right and everyone has to be perfect. Okay, um, I'm sure you have uh, examples of that that you can point to, um, but you know, there's always the sense that, that we're never good enough. Uh, in the broadest sense, this is the good versus evil debate. Good and evil are subjective terms, but the good has somehow become wrapped up in the perfect. Uh, the word perfect comes from perficery, which means to finish. According to the strict Latin definition, you're not actually perfect until you're dead. Uh, the idea comes from the Christian backdrop of Western culture. Monotheistic religion demands unerring obedience to dogmatic laws with dire consequences for those who stray in many traditional dogmas. St. Paul says in Philippians 3.12, not that I have already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. This idea of striving for something beyond humanity is not unique to St. Paul or even Christianity. Striving for the quote unquote good means one or two possible things. It can mean continually comparing ourselves to an ideal and falling short, or it can mean believing we have attained the ideal and judging others who have not. From this wide view, we see the problem that leads to tribalism and conflict. Eric Erickson, the psychoanalyst, not the conservative pundit, just to be clear, uh, referred to this problem as pseudo-speciation, the idea that one group of humans is superior to another on some kind of economic, cultural, or moral grounds. In short, we have been looking at the problem of division the wrong way. 
Modern secular society focuses on reason and assumes this as the default behavior for humankind. Modern monotheistic religions focus on obedience and they blame crises on disobedience as their ancestors did. The influence of rationality and science combined with monotheistic religious ideas leaves us in a lopsided state. And in these recent years of crisis, fear has left us more rigidly polarized. Unless we examine these modes of thinking and make some attempt to consider a new way, we'll never get beyond the problem. Okay, so what are we saying here? This, this covers certainly the first two bullet points. And that is that this, when I say that thinking is lopsided, I mean, it's decidedly what we're going to, you're going to see is what we term masculine. Okay, and when I say masculine in an archetypal sense, um, <clears throat> we're talking about a particular set of qualities, as you can imagine, one of them has to do with rationality and reason. Okay, uh, and you know, and again, nothing wrong with rationality and reason. We're not saying, we're not suggesting that, you know, everybody should, you know, I mean, there's plenty of people who are unreasonable out there, right? Um, and and not, that's not that's not necessarily a particularly good thing. But what we also in in this championing of reason. We discount our feelings. We discount um, our imaginative ideas. We discount um, our intuition, which is often telling us the truth, whether that truth is apparent or not, logically. And we we just completely cut ourselves off from nature. And any any kinds of of feelings or connections we have are often like regarded as either dismissed as, you know, um, you know, it, it's somehow ridiculous in some in some fashion, often as delusional or illusory. Um, and because you're so delusional, you know, um, <clears throat> you know, any, any idea that falls outside the norm is just nonsense. It's delusional. It's this, it's that it's, you know, we, you know, we need to live in a world of, of sense all the time. Um, although that's, you know, and, and while in, in the, mo in the, in the broadest sense, I would agree with that. Um, there's a lot of things that are, that are defined as sense that, um, maybe don't make a whole lot of sense in, in, in this particular uh, way of thinking about it, but it's lopsided. It basically discounts, um, it discount, discounts feelings. It discounts, like I said, discounts intuition. There's this idea that you always have to act. You have to step up and you have to be an individual and you have to take responsibility. And again, nothing wrong with any of those things, but there's times when, yes, it benefits you to withdraw. It benefits you to be passive. It benefits you to, um, to think about the collective rather than just yourself, okay? So, uh, you know, and we'll look at all those ideas. But this is what I mean by lopsided thinking. And this lopsided thinking, because we associate, we, we've come to take what we think of as religious monotheistic ideas about the good, uh, and, and we've kind of melded them with the ideas about what's true and what's real, okay? That those all seem to be equated with this idea of good. Um, and that that's what we need to strive for and we need to get rid of everything else. <clears throat> and that's lopsided because as it's gonna turn out, we need all that other stuff. Okay. So, okay, so the last bullet point on here, I do talk about this um, and I say, okay, so what else, what other way can we look at the life history and the current events? Jung speaks about the shadow, uh, the weaker side of our psyches. We identify with failure, weakness, shame, and ultimately with evil. The shadow becomes an amorphous other and our tendency to strive for good over evil makes us think we can banish or eradicate the other uh, and everything will be wonderful but we can never banish the other, we need to embrace it. Uh, embracing the other does not mean committing evil acts. On the contrary, we commit evil acts because we are in denial of the other. The other is something within ourselves. Um, and I should, I would amend now and say, yes, it's something that can be outside of ourselves too. Um, but a lot of times the, the reaction to the other is, is an internal thing. Um, <clears throat> Uh, but it's often projected onto those who are different, hence the tendency to demonize minority groups and immigrants, for instance. This allows us to justify keeping quote unquote lesser individuals in their place or getting rid of them altogether. We also live in a culture of safe spaces that encourages us to avoid what is uncomfortable, which only adds to the problem. Anything that causes discomfort becomes bad or in broader terms, evil. So as I say, it's with this idea of good versus evil that I begin this work. Uh, and now you're going to go back to our thesis. Belief in an immortal soul and salvation has paradoxically negative impact on perceptions of the archetypal feminine and myth, religious scripture, and philosophy. And this can be demonstrating using the lens of depth psychology. Myth is an expression of fundamental human behaviors, as it provides a narrative of things that can't be spoken about directly. I'm focusing on the mythologies and beliefs about death and the afterlife, as death is the ultimate unknown. Okay. So 
Um, so this is where this is okay. So this, of course, is going to lead you probably to a number of questions, starting with death. Talk about death. So death is a topic generally avoided in our culture. Um, go into any bar, sit down, and, and if people start a conversation with you and you start talking about death, people will immediately stop talking to you because um, this is not a subject that people are comfortable with. Um, people, you know, they they're you know they they want to focus on the distractions of life. And they don't think about death. I mean, you know, you can have. Uh, I mean, the existentialist philosophers certainly talk a lot about this too, about, you know, avoidance of death um, or Heidegger's Dasein, you know, the idea of um, living authentically, um, which means living with the reality of death. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a topic we generally avoid. And in, psycholo in psychological studies, you know, modern psychological studies, we're not talking about psychoanalysis per se. Um, you know, there's, there's been a couple of different approaches, but not much of an approach. Um, Mainstream psychology, particularly de developmental psych, okay, which was more mainstream. Mm, I don't know. I don't know how much it's used now. Certainly, um, throughout like seventies, eighties, nineties, you still saw um, developmental psych uh, appearing. And Erickson, who I quoted, was is, is part of that that group. Um, <clears throat> but developmental psych has, you know, talks about death as kind of a task that one has to prepare for. And it falls a little bit in line. It, it relates to something known as object relations theory, which is the idea that when you're an infant, you don't have a sense of your own identity. Okay, you're, you're, you identify with the mother. Now, we can talk about all the problems with thinking about things only in that term, but let's just go with it for now. The mother is, you know, the baby is, is born out of the mother, okay? And the mother, in theory, is the one who suckles the baby, who holds the baby. You know, the baby sees itself initially as part of the mother. At some point, and it doesn't take that long for this to happen, the infant like can recognize its own reflection in a mirror and see itself as something and recognize that that's them and that there's something distinct from, you know, from mama or whoever's acting as mama. So um, <clears throat> at that point, the child begins to develop an identity. And it's an individual identity as opposed to one where they are connected to someone else. Okay. And a lot of this has to do with object relations. They, they talk about the fact that when children are, you know, um, you know, like the idea of a child needing a teddy bear or some kind of a toy, they refer to it as a transitional object. So the idea is that you are, um, you know, that, you know, if, if mom and dad leave and leave you with a babysitter, um, you know, you miss mom and, you know, you miss them. So that, 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 that teddy bear becomes like the replacement. It's the transitional object. And it's part of that sense of not feeling separated in that way. But as one gets older, you know, the, the more of those kinds of, um, you know, the, those, those transitional things go away and you develop in your own identity and you stand on your own and you have your own personality um, and, you know, which develops as you get older. I mean, the, the, the you know, um, most psychological, uh, developmental psych talks about this as being kind of the first part of the development of your personality. Jung would say it goes up to age 35. Okay. Um, but 35 is kind of arbitrary and that doesn't only, it doesn't always work the way it's not, it's not very linear. Let's put it that way, but nonetheless, it's assumed by about the age of like seven or eight, you have a fully formed personality. And then of course, then you're moving, um, once you get out of your, what's considered your childhood, you're now moving into adolescence. And we all know um, how adolescence is, those of us who, you know, you're just totally embarrassed to be seen around your parents, um, you know, that kind of a thing where you want, you want to be separate. You know, what you're doing <clears throat> is your own thing. This is when you start hiding things about yourself from your parents because they want to prove. Um, and there's many permutations of that. But, you know, but we see this happen. We see this, um, you know, we, we're we getting it. We're now getting out of, you know, the, the idea that we are, you know, you, you start to break away from the family unit. And eventually at some point you end up, you know, you might, you might go off to college, you might um, get a job, you know, whatever it is. Once you're finished your schooling, you're considered an adult. Um, in theory, now this doesn't always happen in modern times, I've noticed, but now you're going off, you're an adult, you're on your own. And, you know, at some point, maybe you'll get married and start your own family. Maybe not. I mean, you're, you're basically going to go off and be the person that you are 
Um, but frequently, in a lot of cases, that means there's going to be a reconnection with the family, okay? So you are, um, <clears throat> so, so, as you, so as you've developed yourself as an individual, now all of these other new life events and new transitions occur that kind of bring you around. Um, and again, it depends on your relationship to your family, obviously, but usually there's a sense of now you're looking to reintegrate that. And that, that follows along, you know, with that journey. But then, then of course, after you've spent your life, you know, maybe, maybe had your career, maybe raised your kids or whatever, you get to a point, um, certainly this happens uh, in, um, in India, there's the thought that, you know, once one has fulfilled that aspect of their worldly life, but then that's when they might go off and, and meditate or, you know, go into an ashram or, or do something or, you know, basically withdraw in preparation for death. Okay. Because now, now, you know, okay, you, you've done the living of life. You've done all the things for the external world. Now you're not only dealing with the internal world, but whatever may be beyond that. Okay. So this is the idea of death as a task with preparation. <clears throat> um, but as far as the, um, you know, but as far as the day-to-day -day person, like, you know, if you ask somebody who's 18 year old about, uh, 18 years old about death, or if you ask somebody who's, um, you know, a lot of people just aren't thinking about it. And we spend most of our time just trying to stave it off um, or try to stave off, you know, trying to, re you know, even without death, trying to retain youth, you know, trying to do things to make ourselves look younger or, um, you know, the proverbial midlife crisis, where when you, when you reach that point, you start trying to do all those things that you wanted to do when you were younger. You know, it's, um, you know, we, we have a lot of ways of staving that off. And cognitive psychology tends to see death as a distortion or a source of anxiety. Um, I'm taking a lot of this from Robert Kastenbaum's studies. Um, where he actually has a, a couple of works on, you know, a couple of editions of a work on psychology of death and doing a survey. And um, let's see, let me just find where I have that here. Yes. Um, yeah, as, I, as he says here, it says, um, and of course this was all, and he, he takes note here of how little was published on death prior to 1992, okay? And uh, he says, cognitive and behavioral scientists tend to view death as a distortion and patterns of behavior with study with regard to anxiety responses. So death is, is only studied in respect to the anxiety that it causes, okay? Uh, and of course, yes, the developmental schools, um, the psychology views death as a task, something people prepare for as they get older. And <clears throat> that latter view influenced bereavement and hospice counseling. Okay. The psychoanalytic approach, and I said, including folks like Freud and Jung, um, was largely discredited in favor of evidence-based models based on studies. Okay, um, so yeah, so now now we're kind of like psychoanalysis. You're okay. You've just said that people have discarded this in terms of for evidence-based studies. So why are you using it? Okay, and so first, let's talk about why it's been just, you've been discredited in a lot of models says the argument is there's no evidence for psychoanalytic assertions. They've not been tested. The volumes of case studies and dream studies collected by Jung in particular were not seen as sound methodology in a field moving towards a neurology-based view of psychology, neuro neurological and cognitive, you know, which all has to do with your thoughts, with your body chemistry, with your, your processes, uh, you know, perhaps having its logical extension in things like evolutionary psychology. Okay. Um, which is that everything, everything is based on either reproduction or some other kind of biological urge, um, which actually when I think about it, sounds quite Freudian. Anyway, um, you know, so Jung may have enacted his own researches based on patterns he saw in his own case studies, but these do not carry the quote unquote rigor required of modern psychological studies. On the one hand, it's a sound criticism. It's one thing to say, for example, that our behavior is influenced by unconscious archetypes, but where's the proof? Studies about attitudes can run into trouble because they're largely seen as the vehicle of writer bias. Um, this was meant um, like Ian Morris. This is um, he criticized uh, Christiane uh, Sorvino Inwood's theories on Greek death attitudes because, as he says, we can't say for sure that this was the attitude of the ancient Greeks, and that's true. We weren't there. We don't know. You know, I mean, we can see writings and so forth of people, but. Um, even, even when we have something like that, we're just inferring, you know, we, we were not there to live whatever the, um, the, the zeitgeist was, whatever the, the, cult, the cultural context was. Um, <clears throat> so as we said, how can we, how can we speak for everyone? Say, I personally may, may be afraid of death, but I can't simply assume that all people around me have the same attitude um, or same fear or the same uh, narrative. So on the other hand, 
as I say in point two here. However, modern psychological approaches to death tend to be limited in their scope. Focuses on attitudes towards physical death, the concept of death, as I'm putting it in quotation marks, is much broader. In ritual and myth, it also is connected with major life changes. As we will see, the movement from childhood to adolescence, marriage, having children, all count as a type of death in the transformational sense. Okay, in the transitions, when I talk about people being involved with the liminal, you're on a boundary. I know liminal is used a little differently in archaeology, but nonetheless, uh, archaeology, I'm sorry, and anthropology, um, the idea of liminal space and so forth. But but yeah, when you're on the boundary, when you are, uh, you know, this is also a type of death, as it were, um, as, as you make that um, move. But they involve, quote unquote, dying to an old life in order to start a new one. While well, Kastenbaum cites studies focusing on anxiety about death and its possible relationship to other things, like, for instance, test anxiety, there doesn't seem to be much of a focus on these other kinds of death. For our purposes, both are important. When you look at death in the context of religion, myth, and the complexities of consciousness, there still isn't a better way to look at the common stories and symbols than Jung's way for all of its imperfections. Uh, the quantitative side of the question is interesting, but does not allow us to go very far with our inquiry into the meta narrative of death in Western culture. Okay. So, hence, this is why I start with psychoanalysis, because in spite of any critiques of Jung, um, it's still Jung, Jung is okay. Jung is, it's important to note that Jung is hated by both people on the science and the religion side. Okay. And he, he tends to be hated by scientists for the reasons I just outlined. He's not scientific enough. He's not evidence-based enough. Okay. Now, mind you, you know, he and Freud are both doing, you know, kind of early psychology at a time, you know, long before any of the, this kind of, this level of scientific method and, um, you know, you know, psych experimentation and so forth was brought in uh, many, you know, a few decades later. But it's, you know, you know, but you know, so so people tend to kind of dismiss it. I've 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 talked to psych professors um, when I used to work in the library who would say, "You can just throw all the Freud and Jung away." I was like, "You shouldn't be teaching this course." <laughs> I mean, even if there's somebody who I really like, and I, you know, professors who you know who I think basically have a good grasp of their subject, I'm like, if you're saying that, uh, or maybe maybe it's not fair to say they shouldn't teach it, but at least they should rethink it um, because there's there's a lot of concepts that are, are still used in modern psychology. Uh, that, that come from this, come from psychoanalysis, idea of projection, for example, um, ideas about, um, you know, uh, a lot of, lot of personality typologies come out of this early psychology. Um, there's, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of terminology, um, you know, like I said, projection is the one that mainly comes to mind, but there's, you know, there's, there's other ways that we talk about people's behavior that's still used that comes directly out of psychoanalysis. And psychoanalysis shouldn't be thrown away. There's still there's still Jungian therapists out there, and I actually I actually at one point almost became a Jungian therapist. But um, not only it wasn't so much the academic side of it that was a problem, but the, it was the expense. It was the expense. It's because you because what you have to do is you have to have a certain background already in counseling and psychology. Um, you don't necessarily have to be a licensed therapist initially, but you have to have that background. And then on top of that, you have to do something, log something like 300 hours with a supervisor. Uh, first of all, you've got to like do, do several hundred hours you know, of your own therapy. And then you have to do another like 300 hours seeing patients with a supervisor and you pay for all that. And so, you know, the, the, the price tag gets really, really high. Um, so, but that's the way one becomes a Jungian therapist. And it's, um, it was just too expensive and it wasn't, it wasn't doable for me. Um, but I met a lot of people who were thinking about doing that course who were already professional counselors who were classically trained and trained according to what we now would see in the um, master's in counseling programs and things like that. And, uh, you know, the, um, you know, it's, it's usually like a, a kind of a master's of social work or, uh, you know, licensed social work counselors or whatever, you know, the, those, those particular titles. Um, a lot of them said they were getting into Jungian therapy because they found that what they were actually taught in graduate school, the way they were told you're supposed to do it, they said it was heartbreaking because it actually doesn't help people in a lot of ways. It actually hurts people. Um, and I've, I've heard a lot of stories about that. You know, it becomes more about diagnosing in a medical sense, like putting a label on somebody about who you are, what you are. Um, and it does become very reductive because a lot of it is about cognition, about how you just need to change your thought patterns, which sounds very new agey to me. Um, but, and it, you know, 
you know, that, that may account for some things, but it, it's certainly the stuff that's much deeper. These interactions with what's numinous uh, aren't accounted for in that psychology. They're just treated as something that you medicate away. And that's not, um, that's not how that should work. Um, so to me, um, but, but psychoanalysis and Jung's extensive research into mythology, alchemy, uh, various, re you know, religion, all of these things in the way in which he defines, um, his terms and looks at, you know, his patient's symptoms and looks at their dreams and, and things like that. Of course, dreams are the language of, of the soul. They're the way in which, um, our unconscious expresses itself and expresses itself symbolically. I mean, what you see in a dream is never, almost never literally true. I would say maybe there's a rare case where maybe, you know, it is precognitive or something, but generally speaking, the weird crap you see in your dreams is, it's a symbol. It's, it's pointing you to something else that you need to pay attention to or an attitude you have or an anxiety you have or, or something, okay? Something maybe your consciousness is avoiding. So, it's the only place where where serious language has been developed to deal with these, you know, what what science stays away from as what they call, you know, with kind of disdain, like teleological. Although I don't necessarily like that word either, because it's it's very platonic. But um, <clears throat> so you can't can't bring this idea of the spiritual into it. On the other hand, people in religion hate Jung because they feel that his and and I find this in people who practice in the occult too, is that they find his his approach, you know, with archetypes and so forth to be quote unquote reductive. It's reductive. So that's what people don't tend to like about it. Um, however, I would not agree that that's, that's um, the case. I think it's the ways in which some of those terms have been misused like archetype um, or co-opted to be used for different things that have made people think that it's a kind of reduction. So I'll talk about that. Okay. So What's the problem of change and death? Okay, we were talking all this stuff about death, 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 right? What does death have to do with any of this? Um, you know, why, why are we looking at the afterlife? And what does that have to do with the feminine, right? So what are we talking about with the afterlife? Okay, first, um, I, I talk about this. I think there's a paper on academia.edu about it as well. Um, one of my initial papers was called um, Afterlife Mythology and Religious Conflict. And it was, it was something I presented at AAR. It was really the first time I was trying to put together the ideas that eventually became this book. And I had cited like five different characteristics of ancient ideas about death in the Near East. Very careful to say in the Near East, uh, not including Egypt, because Egypt has its own, its own system. And, um, you know, the Egyptian system has been around for a very long time. Um, but we have this, um, the ancient beliefs about death, okay, as we see here, basically when you're dead, you're dead, no matter who you are, okay? Uh, the soul or the psyche, well, no, not even the psyche, the soul was considered to have various parts. Now, if you look at ancient Egypt, they cite about five different components to the soul, which we'll talk about when we talk about chapter one. Uh, the Greeks had two. Uh, they mentioned the, the psyche or the psyche and uh, the Adelon. Okay, psyche is sort of the, the vital component of you, the vital essence of you. Um, you know, we see the, the uh, mythology of Eros and Psyche, for example. Um, you know, that, that particular myth, uh, Psyche is, is, is uh, portrayed as this beautiful woman, more beautiful than Aphrodite. And that's the image of the soul, okay, which Jung would call the anima, um, you know, at least for, you know, men or those who are more masculinely oriented would be, you know, their, their soul would be feminine and therefore it would be, this is the psyche. Um, now, but the, uh, you know, but the other piece of the soul is the, is the Adelon and that is the shadow or the shade that is left behind. So when you read the Odyssey, for example, and there's that section where Odysseus uh, sees his mother in the underworld and he goes to, to, to put a, his arms around her and she just smoke. And he asks whether or not this is some kind of deception of Persephone. And she says to him, no, he says, she says, Queen Persephone is not, not deluding you. Um, you know, the, she says, the soul flies away, you know, and then what's left is, is this insubstantial, you know, you know, the substance of this is, is and, and then there's nothing left but this shadow. That's just what's left of you after you die. And that's what they call the Adelon. It's the shadow of the person in the underworld. Uh, and, and interesting, you know, like Heracles, for example, the great hero who is made immortal, you know, now they say when Heracles dies, he becomes a god and he goes up to Mount Olympus and he's married to Hebe, who's the, uh, the cupbearer of the gods, along with uh, Ganymede. And 
so he's, you know, so, so Heracles is now a god, but Odysseus still sees his Adelon in the underworld, you know? Um, and he even talks about that. Well, we know the other part of him is up on Mount Olympus, but this part of him's here. So it's, it's a very different idea about death. And first of all, you know, the idea of the underworld, Hades is not hell. Hades is not a place of punishment. Yes, Tartarus is part of Hades, but it's part of Hades. So is the Elysian Fields. H Hades is just, it's just the place under the earth. Okay, it's just, and it's just where you go. They, they, you know, put your body in a tomb when you die. And, you know, you know, it's the idea of, you know, if everything comes out of the earth, if the earth is what, you know, produces life, then, you know, earth also produces death, right? And it's not about being punished. It's just, it's just, that's, you're dead. That's how it is. So, I mean, obviously in Greek mythology, there's a few, few cases of people who are actually punished eternally in, in Tartarus. Uh, and of course, the a lot of the Titans are, are kept down in that, um, that region. But strictly speaking, for the ordinary person, people like you and me, you know, it's just, just a regular thing. Even the heroes. I mean, you hear about the heroes uh, being taken away or transported to the Elysian Fields, which is, you know, probably the most pleasant place in the underworld. But nothing's a punishment. It's just, you're dead. That's it. Um, and, thus, and thus, you're weaker. That's why um, necromancers frequently had to feed blood to, um, you know, if they were going to, to practice, they would, you know, slaughter a, a brand or and the blood would go down and the dead, you know, are said to drink the blood so that they can have that vitality again. Because it was believed a lot of your soul and your essence was connected with your blood. Okay. Okay. Um, so that was, that was the way that it was. Now, what we discuss in this book is the way in which philosophy, now, yeah, a lot of, a lot of it's Greek philosophy, but it's also philosophical influences from other places, from Persia, for instance, from Egypt. Um, there becomes this striving for spirit over the body. Um, and, and Plato uh, uses the phrase, uh, you know, is soma, is say, um, it, he talks just about soma and sema, which is with, like a pun, you know, that the, the body, you know, one stands for body and one stands for tomb, you know. So the idea of the body is a tomb. Uh, and that this is this idea that, you know, uh, th this is where we get this idea that the flesh, the flesh is heavy and it's weak and, and one has to, um, it's, you know, it's very Eastern idea in a way, uh, detach yourself from, from the pleasures of life and, uh, you know, abstain from certain things. And of course, you know, obviously study philosophy because that makes you very rational, which makes you very good and, and very moral and very, you know, this is also in, in Greek philosophy is the first time you actually start to hear the gods being spoken about in moral terms where people start calling Zeus out for cheating on Hera, you know? It, it's a whole, you know, that, that's where you start to see morals come into religion. There's, there's no morals in ancient religion. Um, and it's not to say that ancient people didn't have some kind of an ethical code, but it was not part of their religion. It's just, these are forces, you know, uh, in nature, they're, they're actual spirits, they're there. You, um, and you try to make them happy. You try to, you make sacrifices to them. You, you supplicate them when you need something. Um, and if they're pissed off, you try to appease them. That's about it. And there's no rhyme or reason for why those forces could suddenly turn on you. Okay. They could be bestowing you with gifts one day and they could like kick your ass the next. It doesn't, there's no rhyme or reason to it. And so when people read Greek mythology and say, oh, I don't understand why the gods, the gods aren't ethical and they're not people. That's the other thing too. You started to see this anthropomorphizing. You started to make the gods into people. And, you know, yeah, I mean, you do see statue, statuary representing them as looking like people and so forth, but the understanding of them is that they're not, they're not like you and I, you know, they're, they're, they're something other, they're something other. And they're not something, um, you know, one of the one of the things I had remember talking about was these. Um, there's a book called uh, Achilles in Vietnam, and I used to teach that in my Troy and the Troy Moore class. And this was a book by uh, Jonathan Shea, is the author, and he's uh, basically a therapist who works with uh, you know Vietnam vets who have PTSD. And he talks about religion because um, he, he basically he's taking the entire um, therapy process and he's had and he's bringing the Iliad into it in particular in this one um the, the account of the warriors in the Trojan War and trying to compare it to the experiences of, of actual military vets and he he talks about with religion he said a lot of people went over to Vietnam you know voluntarily who were Catholic because they were told uh that you know um you know God hates communism and God will reward you you know um for fighting the communists 
you know, God, in other words, they were confident God's going to give us victory because we are on the side of God. We're on the side of good. We're on the side of right. So when the war turned out the way it did, where there's sort of a, you know, there, there's cases of win the battle, but not necessarily the whole war. Um, and Vietnam vets who came home and were treated like they were losers. Um, you know, even though I, whether, whether, you know, what, what was won and what was lost is, is very questionable. And I would never say to a Vietnam vet anything like that. Um, obviously they, they went through, through terrible things. Um, and, you know, they should be respected for, for what they did, um, because they did this, you know, you know, military service of their country. Right. But it's, you know, but the idea of these is many of them came back, you know, saying either coming to the conclusion, either God hates me, um, or there is no God or, uh, you know, God betrayed me in some way. You know, either way, there's there's this complete crisis. People who are very, very devout in their belief, it's just completely crushed because this, there's this belief that, that God, God should have let us win. And you know, he points out in the Trojan War, you know, you see sacrifices being made to the gods on both sides. And sometimes it's effective. A lot of the times it's not. And a lot of times you'll hear heroes, you'll hear Hector at some point say, well, you know, I guess they like their sacrifice better. You know, nobody, nobody acts like this is a reason to not believe in the gods. Okay. It's a different, different idea. It's a completely different idea. Um, but nonetheless, when you, once you start getting into these moral ideas of religion, okay, once you start striving for spirit over things of the body, once the, once everything of the flesh becomes this later word that comes up, uh, missing the mark or being sinful is the way that we translate that now. Um, there, there was no ancient Greek word, real word for sin. This is a concept that definitely comes with what we think of as New Testament Greek. Um, there's, uh, you know, ancient Greeks, you know, when people talk about sin in the ancient Greeks, I'm like, no, there was no concept. I mean, you know, Plato may have been approaching some kind of idea of it, but that's not, I would not say there was any concept of sin. Um, you know, but once sin becomes this, this religious matter, okay, and now there's the idea of being saved from not only from sin, but also being saved from death. You see, because they were almost equivalent. Like, yeah, you, you screw up and you, that's when punishment and reward become associated with the afterlife. And you even see this as, you know, um, in epics like the Aeneid, for instance, which tries to imitate the Odyssey, but has a very different inflection about what happens uh, in the underworld and about people being punished by the Furies, for example, um, you know, for their, for their sins or their crimes <clears throat> or Plato's vision of Ur and the Republic, the way he... Um, talks about souls that are going to be reincarnated, but, um, you know, they're going to rise up or go down depending on whether they've been good or bad. Like you, this is where you start to see this idea, but nonetheless, and then of course you get to Christianity, which is the idea, oh, the sacrifice of Christ will, you know, save everybody from this. Um, and then the question becomes, um, James Hillman actually has a really good section on it in his book called the dream in the underworld, where he says, uh, um, you know, when you exchange, you know, what, what, what do you lose when you exchange soul for spirit? And then, you know, what happens when um, Thanatos, the god of death, suddenly becomes Satan, somebody suddenly becomes an evil. Um, so big, when, when you reject death in that way, you know, so, you know, wholly reject death as being part of, like somehow being unnatural and something to be conquered. Um, that, that has a lot of consequences. And one of those consequences as we're going to see, affects the way we view the feminine. Okay, archetypes. Archetypes, you know, and as I said, the first rule of archetypes is that you don't talk about archetypes, mainly because archetypes really, if you're really, really honest about it, really can't be talked about. I mean, Jung spends pages on it. He, he's written so many essays. I mean, you know, on the, on the archetype of the anima, you know, the, the structure of nature, the dynamics of the psyche is all these essays on archetypes. He never really actually tells us what they are. Like when we talk about the anima, for instance, the soul archetype that's supposed to be within the male, um, he talks around it all the time, but the ascent, it's kind of, almost kind of like, you know, you know what it is, right? Uh, no, we, we don't know what it is. And because the problem is because it has no solid definition. He's trying to describe a kind of a collection of qualities um, that we experience when we encounter um, these, these kind of for, uh, these forces that he does describe as both numinous and autonomous. An archetype is not a label. I remember looking, I was, I was looking for something on archetypes on the internet. I remember seeing this thing about, you know, the 12 archetypes of brands or something. I was like, get out of here. That's not an archetype. 
that's a label. That's a, that's, that's just a, you know, you're just using the word archetype and you're using it the wrong way. That's not what an archetype is. An archetype is not just a label. An archetype is a set of qualities. When it impacts your psyche, you become psychotic. I mean, it literally, it's like, it's like a possession. When we talk about demonic possession, you know, it, it, sometimes I think it's a little hard to tell whether or not you're actually being possessed by an external spirit, or are you dealing with an archetypal possession? This archetypal possession can also make you do absolutely insane things because whatever the quality is of that particular archetype seizes you and takes over your conscious psyche. Okay. Um, so when we talk about these things being in the collective unconscious, or as a lot of uh, esoteric practitioners and occultists will say, will say, yes, but they also have a physical reality as well out in the world. People who do ritual will say, yes, that, you know, they're not merely archetypes. Okay. They'll say, you know, they're, they're actual things. Well, yes, they obviously, yes, they can have an autonomy and be their own thing, but archetypes also have an auto autonomy. So where's, where's the line there? I mean, I tend to think of an archetype as the way in which our consciousness interacts with, you know, with something which could be external, but it could also be part of what's in our collective unconscious, or it could be both at the same time. I don't, you know, I, I'm not averse to that idea because there are just times when you look at this stuff that it's very hard uh, with certain daemons, for example, um, I, I do podcasts on um, mania and Lethe, um, who are, you know, the rivers of oblivion and forgetfulness versus uh, mania, who represents madness. Um, so, or even the furies, which represent a certain kind of consciousness or a kind of um, mental boundary or, or, you know, proper boundary with regard to your ancestors and, and, you know, you know, and, you know, and, and the roles of females and, and so forth. There's this you know, um, you know, yeah, they're, they're, they're entities, but they're also, they also represent parts of our psychology. So I don't know. I, I'm not, I am, I'm not, I, I tend to be somewhat defensive of using the term archetype, but I'm not using it as a label. I'm, I'm using it in the current sense of something numinous and autonomous. And this does provide a framework for talking about how forces in, you know, in the, in nature, in, in what's out, what we think of, think of as outside of ourselves. Um, how they impact our perceptions and our thinking and how we, how we process them, you know, through this function that seems to be archetypal. Okay. That doesn't necessarily mean, however, that gods are archetypes. Okay. That's something you don't want to make that mistake. You know, you know, we, we don't call Hermes or, you know, Hermes as some people call him the, the trickster archetype. I mean, yes, he embodies the archetype of the trickster, but that doesn't mean that the trickster is Hermes. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, you gotta be careful about the terminology, but archetype is a term that I use. And I do think it's a useful one. Now, in Jung's view, because obviously there were criticisms, Walter Burkhardt criticized him, and I can tell you what he said, uh, when he talks about archetype theory, he says, and, and also just the notion of universal symbolisms of different kinds, because archetypes do imply that there's some kind of a, a consistent quality, which we refer, they're referring to as a universal quality. He says, uh, Burkhardt says, has the advantage of admitting neither verification nor refutation since those non-empirical entities may be constructed to fit exactly the presuppositions of some set of myths. Still, it's been notoriously difficult to maintain any kind of consistency in such constructs, keeping in touch at the same time with the myths as attested and not losing all contact with empirical reality. Granted, there are unconscious dynamics of the psyche. So he does grant that, but there's no reason to assume there that they are also, they are isomorphic with any tale, which belongs after all, not to the realm of the unconscious, but to language. Hmm. Well, um, to say that language is not part of what we have in the unconscious, I mean, yeah, language does have to do with our conscious expression of things. You know, I see a tree outside my window. I, I use the word tree. That's the that's the the symbol that the, the symbolic symbol in language that I use to describe that concept. To say that it's somehow divorced from this, I I don't. Um, I don't quite agree with that. Uh, but Jung, Jung has said, not necessarily in, you know, reaction to Burkhardt's specific charge, but into the way that people talk about universalism and criticize him for it. He said, he says, I've been frequently accused of superstitious belief in inherited ideas, quite unjustly, because I have expressly emphasized that these concordances are not produced by ideas, but rather by the inherited disposition to react in the same way as people have always reacted. Again, the concordance has been denied on the ground that the redeemer figure is in one case a hare, another a bird, another a human being. This is to forget something which so much impressed a pious Hindu visiting an English church that when he got home, he told the story the Christians worship animals because he had seen so many lambs about. The names matter little. Everything depends on the connection between them. 
Thus, it does not matter if the treasure is a gold ring or another a crown, a third a pearl, and a fourth a hidden hoard. The essential thing is the idea of an exceedingly precious treasure hard to attain, no matter what you call it locally. So he's more interested in the narrative behind it and not so much the form. He's like, these are, he, I'm just, he's talking about the forms that they take, but he's more interested in the psychology and the behavior that's implied or the reaction that's implied um, in, in, in humankind, which does actually appear to be quite similar even across cultures, even if, even if the understanding and, and aspects of the narrative are different. Um, there is a way, there are certain reactions that we all tend to have as human beings. And that's the part that's fascinating. Okay, masculine and feminine, everyone's waiting for this, right? What do we mean by these terms when you're not talking about sex or gender? Um, and understanding too that now, you know, well, maybe not just now, but there's, there's definitely more constructs of, of gender and sex other than masculine and feminine. Okay, and that's, that's certainly something that comes up a lot um, in recent um, discussion. But even putting all that to the side for now, what, what are we talking about? If I talk about the masculine and the feminine, I'm not talking about people. I mean, yes, there are male and female people and, you know, but I'm not, when I use these terms, when I say feminine, I'm not referring to women. When I say masculine, I'm not referring to men. Okay. What am I referring to? Well, as I mentioned here in the book, one of the first ways we can look at the idea of masculine and feminine as an archetypal construct uh, is to look at the, the yin yang, or I have it as yang yin here, just because of how it's described. So, um, so I'm going to read a little bit about this from the introduction. Uh, Jung's view of the anima anonymous in therapy suggests that his own biases about what masculine, or, what his own biases about what is masculine and feminine, but he never gives a formal definition of either term. We can only infer Jung's definitions from his writings. Cynthia Eller's excellent work on the myth of matriarchal prehistory questions these categories and our uses of these categories. She rightly notes that it was often categorized as masculine and feminine does not necessarily apply to either men or women. And yet those idea, those categories are still continually used to define men and women. Our ideas of uh, masculine and feminine um, somehow predetermined in our unconscious. It becomes hard to separate these archetypal ideas from social constructs of gender, and the reality is that they're still applied to men and women even when they don't apply. Social and biological gender constructs are more in question than ever these days, which makes it more necessary for us to understand what we mean by these terms masculine and feminine, even if they are inaccurate as descriptions of human beings. One obvious symbol is the Chinese yin yang symbol, consisting of a circle divided by an S-shaped curve, half black, half white, with a circle of white in black half and vice versa. Jung comments on this symbol. The word hon is translated by uh, Richard Wilhelm as animus. This is in the secret of the golden flower. Uh, indeed, the concept seems appropriate for hon, the character of which is made up of the character for clouds and that of demon. Thus, hon means cloud demon, a higher breath soul belonging to the yang principle and therefore masculine, higher, cloud, okay, sky. Um, after death, Hun rises upward and becomes Shen, the expending and self-revealing spirit or God. Anima, called the Po or P apostrophe O, however you pronounce that, um, and written with the characters for white and for demon, that is white ghost, belong to the lower earthbound bodily soul, the yin principle, and is therefore feminine. So earthly is feminine. <clears throat> after death, it sinks downward and becomes uh, Kui or demon, uh, often explained as the one who returns, that is to earth, a revenant or ghost. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the association of women with earthly death may explain why Jung's collective unconscious is associated with the feminine by Eric Neumann, while the rational conscious mind is associated with masculine. The collective unconscious is the realm of the irrational and the unknown. Psychological interpretation of the hero's journey uh, involves a descent into the underworld, interpreted as a psychological metaphor for getting in touch not only with that which is unconscious, but with that treasure that has relevance for humanity as a whole and not just the individual. Okay. Uh, Jung identifies the Hon as the Logos, okay, which is the term we use for Logos, the, the word. Okay? And in his essay on the Syzygy, he describes the masculine as corresponding to Logos and the feminine as corresponding to Eros. Uh, so we see an identification of the masculine with sky, spirit, rationality, while the feminine is associated with earth, the demonic, and desire. But is this accurate or does it simply represent Jung's own gender prejudices? Uh, Walter Burkert noted earlier, as I'd quoted, that myths and tales belong to the realm of language rather than the unconscious. And I believe this supports Jung's assertions rather than just proving them. Uh, the Ro Roman grammarian Varro once claimed that words associated with the sky were masculine and those associated with the earth were feminine. Uh, while this is etymologically inaccurate, uh, it shows that ancient Romans have had similar prejudices about masculine and feminine. Uh, linguistics, pro linguistics provides 
a noteworthy approach to the question. Uh, Lyra Boroditsky studies referred to by Anthony Corbet in, in, um, in this work, and in in Anthony Corbet's work is called Sexing the World, uh, examine associations with masculine and feminine words. Her first study involved taking the German words for key and bridge and telling one group that the word was masculine, the other feminine, and then asking participants to provide adjectives describing the words. Key is masculine in German and feminine in Spanish, and participants spoke Spanish or German as their native language. German speakers described the English word key as hard, heavy, jagged, metal, serrated, and useful. Spanish speakers described them as golden, intricate, little, lovely, shiny, and tiny. In an attempt to remove cultural bias, she then did a study with a fictional language and pictures. Items were supative or usative, and these corresponded to grammatical gender categories. The results were similar, and the example of a picture of a violin is given in a later chapter of this book. It would be interesting to see this kind of study uh, repeated in other parts of the world, perhaps in an African or Asian country, to see if there's also similar char uh, characterizations. Okay. Uh, linguistic theories of gender and language have suggested another set of categories of masculine and feminine, that of individual versus collective, and I mentioned that here as well. Uh, while there's a disagreement about these categories among linguists, Carl Brugman put forward the argument that Indo-European feminine, suffix femi feminine suffixes, uh, like A, I, E, and I, expressed abstracts and collectives. A similar theory was expressed with regard to Semitic language. While these ideas are contentious, they do suggest a pattern within language that equates the feminine uh, with the collective uh, in a notable number of examples. With regard to social uses of language, Robin, Robin Lakoff offers a syntactic axis with the elements um, clarity, distance, deference, and camaraderie. She uses Clark Gable and Marilyn Monroe as examples of social ideas of masculine and feminine and suggests that Gable falls closer to the clarity distance axis of speech with, with his infamous, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn line in uh, Gone with the Wind, uh, while Monroe is closer to the deference camaraderie part of the axis. In contrast to Gable's characteristic poker face, we have Monroe either smiling or looking sensuous, but certainly wearing an identifiable facial expression. She uses interjections and hedges freely in her dialogue is sprinkled with, I guess, and kinda, in distinction to Gable's unembellished, yep, her sentences seem not to end, but rather to be elliptical as if an invitation to the addressee to finish them for her. Classic feminine deference. Um, Lakoff suggests that the social perception of the deference camaraderie mode of speech falls into the non-masculine and therefore non-normal uh, and is viewed as worse, weaker, or degenerate. Uh, similar to Carol Gilligan's study in a different voice, which suggests that boys tend towards rationalistic and legalistic approaches to questions in psychological tests, while girls tend towards a less definite but more community-oriented response. Gilligan argues that psychologists saw this feminine view in a negative light, okay? And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. I'm going to skip over now because I, I do mention that in another slide. Okay, so there's some suggestion here with masculine and feminine. Um, you know, and of course, in the next slide, I'm going to get into why this, you know, these negative feminine perceptions, some of which I've just talked about here. But there's another thing I want to mention on here, the collective versus the individual. Um, well, that we see in politics, um, you know, because what we think of as more, quote, unquote, social politics or socialist politics tend to be more about the collective, while more capitalistic economic ways of thinking tend to be more individual. It's more about the individual and pulling yourself up by your bootstraps and working hard and, you know, being rewarded for that. Whereas socialism is more about, um, you know, having a having a collective, having a government, you know, an equal distribution, and government taking taxes, and then people, you know, receiving services for those taxes. There's, it's more of a um, a care orientation. It's more of a what we think of as a in this categorization, a feminine orientation. Okay, um, and I know here too, by the way, I say masculine is active, rational; feminine is passive and receptive. Okay. Um, and oftentimes passivity and receptivity is seen as weaker, whereas masculine being active and, you know, strong and assertive and make a decision and don't, don't waffle, make it, you know, that that's, um, whereas the feminine may be more about going with the flow and more about, you know, not, not having to be so decisive or not being necessarily so analytical about things, just kind of letting things come different, different aspects. But again, this is not about what women do versus what men do even though it's interesting that we see these attributes sometimes in the behavior and speech patterns of men and women, okay? Um, but collective versus individual, yeah. So this is what we see politically. Um, and remember now, the feminine is associated with the collective. So when you see this pushback against these ideas, these quote unquote social or socialist ideas, 
a lot of times that comes from this sort of unconscious feeling about the feminine and about what that represents in our culture, about how people see that as lesser, weaker, or immature, or not, um, you know, uh, it, as, you know, just can be dismissed in some fashion. Now, I note here Shaktism, um, <clears throat> which is in Hinduism, and I talk about that a lot with respect to Tantra and Tantric deities, uh, in Hinduism in particular. Shaktism is the idea that the Devi is the, you know, is the, the supreme deity of the universe, as it were, that everything comes out of Shakti. And again, that's the idea that the Shakti energy, you see it in the Hindu uh, epics, where Shakti, you know, it's not the gods who do the fighting, it's the Shaktis. They're the ones that actually do battles with these uh, Ashuras or demonic kind of beings, you know, but they do it at a point when the Ashuras become out of balance when they take over. It's the same thing when they, when they take over, when there's a lopsidedness, when now, um, you know, a, a demon that might have uh, done, you know, you know, you know, practiced austerities and, you know, um, practice certain types of meditation and prayer and so forth, and thus were granted a boon, then become power hungry and greedy and uh, want to be worshipped as gods themselves and, and take over <clears throat> in very narcissistic fashion. And that's where the feminine comes out and, and you know, and in the forms of Kali and Durga and, and slaughters them. Um, and what we also see in Shaktism, uh, I talk about this, I have a podcast for, that I had for patrons only called on the Sri uh, Ardhana Vishwara, which is a form of Shiva Shakti merged together. And the idea is that the, the active principle in that is actually Shakti, it's the feminine. Shiva as the male principle is considered to be passive. And you, you see that demonstrated throughout a lot of these uh, Shaktis, uh, Shaktism and, uh, and a lot of the texts associated with it. So just, in, just want to mention that because that's a counter view that we see from the East, uh, the Far East, and that's, that's very interesting. Um, especially, you know, since we also see yin and yang coming from the Far East as well. But these are uh, different conceptions. But I would say that in our culture, uh, in, in, the America, in America, in, uh, in Europe, and in, in these areas, you know, that the, probably the, the more the idea of, you know, this idea of uh, feminine as having, you know, being earthbound, sensual, uh, passive, uh, having intuitive, emotional, all of these things is, is distinct from this, this um, active, um, rational, um, masculine principle that is, you know, uh, more detached, more, you know, more along some of these models that we've discussed here in the introduction as being, um, you know, more about clarity and about more being assertive and, you know, um, where the other is supposed to be a little more more deferential and steps back, um, perhaps supposed to be submissive to a more dominant masculine. Um, you know, there, there's that there's that idea in our culture, uh, and even with the idea, whole idea of um, you know, um, you know, I'm thinking of the idea of matriarchy and patriarchy. Let's wait on that. I'm going to talk about that later. Okay, so. So here we go, the negative views of the feminine. Now I read you the uh, Robin Lockoff thing where you know there, there's this idea that non-masculine is non-normal in speech patterns. So when, when one defers, that's considered to be somehow not, you know, you're not, you're not speaking directly. You're not, you're not telling people, even in writing and so forth, people tell you be directive, use the active voice, don't use the passive voice, you know, be, be direct and be clear, right? Um, now, Carol Gilligan, I, I talked about what she was saying here. And the study that, that, that is intriguing is the beginning of her book in a different voice and it has to do with uh, something known as Heinz's Dilemma. And we talked about this in graduate school. Heinz's Dilemma was part of a psychological test that was presented to um, boys and girls who were roughly around 11, 12 years old. And I think the two, Amy and Jake, who are the two she mentions here, are about the same age. I think they're 11 years old. And they're roughly... Um, you know, like educationally, academically, they're, you know, both solid students. Um, they both have interests that are not stereotypical, you know, the stereotypical, oh, you know, boys only like this and girls only like this. Well, they, you know, they had some quote unquote non-typical interests, you know, Amy was interested in like science and, you know, <clears throat> mathematics and stuff. And, and Jake had was more, you know, more oriented towards English literature and the humanities, you know, so, you know, there's this, that that's another line too, that, that science and rationality and mathematics is masculine, whereas the, um, you know, more of the humanities, more of the thinking sciences are considered to be more feminine in their, in their um, 
you know, according to this kind of a model. So they're both asked the question, they're both presented with Heinz's dilemma. Heinz's dilemma, okay, Heinz's wife is sick and she's going to die if she doesn't get a certain medicine. Heinz can't afford the medicine. Should he steal the medicine or should he let his wife die? That's the dilemma, okay? Now, Jake answers this by saying, well, you know, uh, I think maybe he should steal the drug uh, because, you know, the pharmacist can get money again, another drug, but he can't get another wife. And, you know, if he, if he had to go to court for it, the judge would probably be lenient, understanding the circumstances. You know, he thinks about it in a very legalistic kind of a way, the way he reasons it out. Uh, when they ask Amy the same question, she says, well, uh, yeah, uh, you know, his wife shouldn't die, but, you know, he shouldn't steal it either. You know, maybe, maybe he can get on a, a payment plan with the pharmacist. Maybe, you know, maybe they could, you know, maybe the community could raise money. Maybe it could, I mean, it looked at her like she was, like she was crazy. In fact, the response was, um, when considered in the light of Kohlberg's definition of stage and sequence of moral development, which is what this test comes out of, her, meaning Amy, uh, moral judgments appear to be a full stage lower in maturity than those of the boy. So in other words, the fact that she thinks about solving the problem a different way makes her immature. Okay, because she didn't answer the question. She had to come up with some other way of looking at it. Okay. So, and, and what's what's feminine about her thinking? It's collective. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe he can get help from somebody. Maybe, maybe it's not just about him running in and stealing the drug and, you know, risking himself. Maybe, maybe he could get help. Maybe somebody would volunteer to help him. You know, it's the idea, support, relationship. Okay. Okay. Um, now here I mentioned psychology and the myth of the matriarchy. And I mentioned this here because I feel that the, what we think of as the matriarchy myth, and, and this often is, if I was going to give a nutshell version of it is that in very, very ancient times, men, um, well, I should say humans, only worshipped a goddess. It was a great mother goddess, and that's all people worshipped. There were no male gods. And then eventually, you know, it's this idea of the quote-unquote Aryan invaders from somewhere, Aral Mountains or something, that come down and bring war and, and all these terrible things, and they conquer the, these, these peaceful goddess cultures, and now we have, you know, now we have all this patriarchy. Um, there's, there, there's a lot of things wrong with that theory. I know a lot of people who still embrace it, um, especially like in witchcraft communities and so forth. And um, I, I just don't, uh, after reading Cynthia Eller's book on it, I, I just, you know, even, even knowing how that book's critiqued, I do tend to agree with her that there really isn't solid evidence. There's a lot of things that we want to see in a certain, a lot of archeological evidence and stuff that we like to see in a certain light. However, my point is, um, because really, Cynthia Eller's point is, well, we don't really know. I mean, you know, maybe there was a matriarchy, but but we don't, we can't really prove that. My point is, okay, even if there was a matriarchy, even if even if that was a real thing, ancient goddess worship was not peaceful, um, and women actually are more the embodiments of war than men are. Okay, and uh, and I talk about that a lot throughout the podcast. Certain figures that I talk about. Um, there's a lot of love goddesses who are also war goddesses, okay? So it's, you know, uh, so what I tend to think of is when you have this idea of, you know, first there was the mother and then um, all these other influences came in and then it became about this very masculine kind of way of thinking. And I would argue, remember, if we go back to what I said about object relations theory, that this has to do with developmental psychology. We start with the mother, you know, or the idea that the child is not separate from the parent, um, which often is, is the mother in some sense, but in some sense, even if it's not female mother, then there's still this idea of a collective, like a family collective. And then eventually as certain things come in over time, there's a movement away and there's an individual, there's that individual, that masculine influence, okay? So I see the matriarchy myth is probably having more relevance there than as some kind of historical fact as to how, how things were. Because one thing I'm, I'm certain of about mother goddess worship, which we saw not only in ancient times, but even in the Roman times, is that it's not, um, it's, it's anything but, but, but you know, <laughs> it's not peaceful, okay? So I, I, I definitely 
Um, I've, I've never seen any examples of that. I mean, there's human sacrifice, there's castration. I mean, this is not, it's not peaceful. Okay. So, um, yeah, so I, so I, you know, this, this plays into this as well, obviously, since we're talking about ancient, ancient myth and religion. Um, and then I think finally, when we talk about this, um, Esther Harding talks about this, um, she says, uh, you know, um, you know, so, okay, so there's, okay, so let's see. Yeah, back to where I have here. I, I go back to object relations theory and I say, children identify with their mothers, gradually develop a sense of self. The sense of self developed by the age of seven, they grow into adolescence, et cetera. Okay, later when the child becomes an adult's gone on their own, they may revisit familial things and reintegrate those into their lives. The idea of starting from the mother and the collective becoming independent is another way of saying we break away from the comfort of the nurturing mother to face conflict in the world. Uh, in the latter part of the quote unquote heroic journey, as we heard of from Campbell and such, of life, the feminine is re-encountered as an anima figure and later perhaps as a wife or significant feminine influence that allows the independent adult to share talents and gifts with the community at large. This is not a regression to childhood, It's the, as, as Freud would have suggested. This is a mature individual coming into adult relationship with the feminine, with a capital F, the archetypal feminine. While the terminology is masculine, women also tend to follow this pattern of development. Esther Harding notes the discomfort of both men and women with the quote unquote feminine in the modern world. Independence, rationality, and unemotional decision-making are valued as strengths. They're all positive traits in human character. I'm not saying they're not, um, but the emotional and the vulnerable should not be discarded as weaknesses. Uh, as Martha Nussbaum states in Rachel Aviv's New Yorker article, what I'm calling for is a society of citizens who admit that they are needy and vulnerable. Our world today consists of tribalism and conflict. There's no middle ground and yielding to another point of view is often treated as a cop-out or an act of treason. Again, it's very aggressively masculine, um, you know, by this definition. There's too much of standing one's ground with guns loaded, not enough effort of understanding and building bridges and building community. Validation goes a long way towards understanding and does not necessarily involve adopting opposing views. Okay, so now we get into these consequences of devaluing the feminine. Um, this psychological split between us and them because there's the idea that the strong, you have to be a strong person who stands their ground. There's no yielding. There's no allowing yourself to feel. There's no empathizing with the other side. There's no, it's the, you know my way or the highway, okay? And this judgment, morality, and rationality valued above acceptance, passivity, emotion, intuition. And I feel it's to our detriment where we've lost connection with ourselves. We're alienated. We're not only alien, that only alienates us from others, but it alienates us from ourselves, from our true nature, from what we really want, from where we're really trying to go. Um, and what's humane, what's empathetic, you know? Um, you know, when I'm in a certain situation, I want people, I don't want people to attack me. I want people to think about where I'm coming from and you know, and that requires a certain amount of empathy. You know, you don't want, you don't want to try to put yourself in someone's place to the point that you, you think, you know, I feel this way, therefore you're going to feel this way. It's not, that's not empathy. Empathy is recognizing when somebody's going through something is saying, you know, I, I, you know, whether you understand the situation or not, whether you can actually relate to the situation or not, you can, you can feel, you can feel along with them and, and pathos, you know, you feel that, 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 you know, um, you know, that um, either their distress or, you know, whatever the emotion is, you, you feel it with them and therefore you show compassion to them or you go easier on them because you understand, you, you're trying to understand what they're going through, even if they're furiously angry. I mean, you're trying to understand. Okay. But we devalue that. It's, you know, everything's about, nope, nope, this is the way it's supposed to be. It's either right or it's wrong. Consequences are not consequences. No, no, no real um, thought about, uh, you know, all these things. And I, and I also like to point out here that um, monotheism and hardcore scientism are really two sides of the, uh, of the same coin. Uh, when I say scientism, I'm referring to, I mean, in theory, when we talk about science, science should be something that adapts and changes. It's supposed to be dynamic. As, as new evidence comes in, then science, the science changes, right? Um, but oftentimes what happens is people will take things that they, they take as the quote unquote laws of science um, and, and, you know, they, you know, or the laws of physics and just say, nope, this is how it is. And there's absolutely nothing else. There's no other way to look at this. There's no other way to think about anything. Any other point of view on this at all is delusional um, or it's just plain wrong. 
Um, and really, there's no difference between that point of view and somebody who says the Bible says it. Uh, so that's how it is. And everything else is wrong. You're just using, you're, you know, it was like Alan Watson said, there's the, um, the ceramic model of the universe and the fully automatic. You know, they're basically the same model. It's just one contains God and one doesn't. Um, so they're two sides of the same coin. And they're both highly rationalistic. Monotheistic religion is extremely rationalistic. It's very moralistic. It's got a lot of, it's got judgment in it. And people who have gotten rid of the God part haven't gotten rid of that piece of it. It's, it's still pretty much the same thing. So in all of these respects, it's lopsided. Uh, the idea of the religion versus science debate is actually kind of ridiculous because it's not really about belief versus facts. It's about the fact that you have two, two sets of individuals that are looking at things pretty much the same way. Now you can say the believer has quote unquote faith, but faith is still the idea. Um, I mean, what faith should be is faith in, you know, believe trusting that things will turn out the way they're supposed to, whatever they are. But a lot of times faith, it's like, no, I, I believe there's a God and I have faith in that. So that's what I stand by, but you're still standing by it on the same kinds of grounds as the rational person in, in terms of, um, how you're rationalizing it, how you're thinking about it, um, you know, regardless of the fact, because in a certain sense, even when somebody believes that scientific laws are all there is, that's still a worldview, that's still a belief, okay? Um, so, you know, in both cases, let's just say, because um, I know I'm sure I'll, some people will get into an argument with me about that, but in, in both cases, you're still dealing, there's still this lack of the feminine with a capital F. There's still... You know, because a lot of times that kind of hardcore, at least I, I'm going to say certain very conservative forms of monotheism are not about feelings per se. Um, they're more about, you know, this is the rules and we don't, we don't deviate from the rules. Okay. So it's, um, you know, so there's, so there's consequences to this. And I feel that um, until we, we bring those elements back into the culture. Uh, COVID's done a tremendous amount with that. I mean, you're, you're, you're starting to see the, the line between people who are interested in what's good for the public versus, well, what's my rights and what's good for me, okay? One's more, one, one would be more feminine oriented, one would be more masculine oriented. Um, and we've seen toxic examples of that too. We've seen, we've seen um, masculinity, which is not toxic in and of itself. Um, it's a necessary component of things, but we've seen toxic examples of that too. Um, you know, these, these ideas that are just taken to an almost destructive kind of extreme. And these are all things that are, that are going on in the cultures right now. And it's not just in the United States, it's going on elsewhere as well. Um, so um, if for no other reason, this is one of the things we need to look at. So uh, that's, let me, let me stop the share here. Okay, so that's my introduction to Death and Maiden. I hope this makes sense to you. I hope you understand what I'm doing when I'm talking about, when I look at things from a psychological standpoint, that this is why I use archetypal psychology. So, because for whatever it flaws may be in, in describing certain things, it does, it is so far the most accurate way of describing these processes that go on when, as we are, are, are trying to process this material, process this material that is not, um, you know, that, 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 isn't, that doesn't fall into the realm of, of fact, shall we say, or things that are laboratory tested and, and, and so forth. Uh, when we're getting into the realms of uh, what, what happens in the psyche and what happens, you know, what, what, what comes in dreams, what comes in symbolism, what comes in our, in our interactions with things that are not necessarily um, part of our, our, our ordinary material reality. Uh, and, and also just in the way that we, the assumptions that we have about the world and the way we interact. Um, and this is what Cthonia is about too. This is why we address issues of the feminine and we look at the motifs and we see how these ideas are demonstrated over and over again. Uh, thanks for listening and hope that you will take my course on Death and the Maiden. Um, they're very inexpensive, uh, $15 each for each section. Uh, and you get a session like this one. Uh, they're available um, at uh, under the Scholars of the Borderland. Uh, thanks so much for listening. Hope to see you there.